Krishan. Welcome to this special uh, third party press conference of uh, 24th International AIDS Conference, AIDS 2022 in Montreal, Canada. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. A special thanks to Dr. Pauli Fujiwara, who has joined in from uh, um, from a, at, at a very odd hour. So, so very grateful indeed. Uh, this is being organized on behalf of Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Health and Development, APCAT, Asia Pacific Cities Media Alliance for Health and Development, APCAT Media, and CNS, and uh, uh, welcome. So it's almost 10.30 so, uh, in India, which is uh, uh, the right time to begin the press conference. So I will hand over to our uh, moderator. We are very honored to have a senior journalist uh, and editor, Rita Vidyadana. She has been the former editor of Jakarta Post and uh, a very noted uh, voice uh, on gender justice on and on health justice within media fraternity globally. So Rita Vidyadana, welcome. You are the founding member of APCAT Media as well. So over to you. We look forward to this session. Thank you, Bobby, for your nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. And many thanks uh, for your kind introduction, Bobby. First of all, I would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Iswar Gilada, Dr. Paula Fujiwara, who are willing to stay awake from San Francisco to be with us today in this important webinar. And also, I would like to thank all participants of the webinars. I hope you are staying healthy. And, and it is unfortunate that our one of our panelists, Dr. Tara Singbam, will not be able to join in because of health issue. Uh, we wish him speed recovery. Many thanks. Uh, as the theme suggests, why are people living with HIV but dying of NCD, TB, and viral hepatitis? Uh, uh, in, during the first session, uh, we would like to learn more about uh, this issue, and we will very proudly present our distinguished panelist, Dr. Iswar Gilada. He is twice elected as government councils member from Asia Pacific of the International Ed Society and distinguished scientists and researchers and doctors. Over to you, Dr. Gilada. Good morning, good evening. Uh, we are a global village, so somewhere there's a good morning, somewhere there's a good evening, somewhere there's a good night. Uh, we are discussing some of the issues related to HIV management. Uh, currently, as all of us know, that a new drug which has come uh, is not new, it's not very new. It has come almost five years back, but in programs all over the world in last two or three years. It is called Dolutegravir. And the uh, previous regimen of three drug regimen, which was called TLE, that is Tenofovir, Lamivudine, and Ifavirenz, where Ifavirenz is exchanged. Uh, but with dolutegravir. So TLE has become TLD. Uh, TLD, there are a lot of advantages. The pill is very small as compared to TLE. Uh, the depression related to ifavirenz, suicidal tendencies related to ifavirenz, early morning uh, woolheadedness, or uh, lack of concentration while driving. So all those issues are taken care of with dolutegravir. Most important uh, with dolutegravir is a very robust drug. Uh, it is uh, uh, robust in two sense. One is very fast acting, and secondly, it is uh, uh, is uh, resistance profile is very good because being a new drug, it was not used earlier. Uh, hardly uh, not even one percent people are registered to this uh, new drug, and therefore, what happens is once you start person on TLD regimen, within two to three months, that person become undetectable, and that is our entire goal currently making HIV positive person undetectable and undetectable is untransmittable. So the greatest prevention can be achieved by making HIV positive person undetectable. And I think that is uh, no other better drug than the lutegravir is available uh, globally. However, whenever such new treatment comes, new drug comes, they will have their own associated adverse effects. And one of the associated adverse effects with the is weight gain. And on an average, Within a year, person gains uh, five kg weight. When we say average, means somebody gets maybe two kg, somebody may get eight kg, but average is five kg weight gain. 
after an year or so the weight gain gets stabilized in a country like india a weight gain is not a problem weight gain is basically a status symbol so uh, our patients are so happy that they come back sir i never gain weight what did you do what kind of medicine you are given i gain 5 kg weight 8 kg weight so not only the patient patient's entire family feels so uh, elated that uh, this doctor has done wonder and my uh, husband or my brother or my the wife uh, uh, has gained the weight but apart from weight gain there are associated complications of weight gain and they are ncds so non communicable diseases and in the non communicable diseases yes uh, because of weight gain there is obesity hypertension diabetes and we have seen a lot of people getting diabetes once they are put on tld uh, when we say lot means it is not 100% but 10 15% 20% people are getting diabetes where diabetes has not been in the family in case where there was a family history of diabetes and it was not manifested now till now but with dulrigavi it get manifested faster so that is a major issue uh, what actually clinician should do whenever actually we have been doing this uh, uh, ever since we started art almost 20 years back 25 years back 24 years back we have been telling people with hiv to have a good uh, re- uh, life with good exercises morning walk yoga and that will take care of lot of issues so had this been done earlier by all the clinicians i think whether you have a dictagravir or dolutegravir that weight gain will be taken care of uh, with the help of uh, exercises uh, cycling yoga swimming so ask people to do that so once they uh, become habituated to that kind of healthy life then the weight gain uh, will not be so much it may be marginally 1 or 2 kg or so however we need to keep on watch and uh, look at uh, how do we work up because on one hand we want a robust drug we want a uh, drug with a very good uh, good excellent uh, resistance profile uh, we want a drug which can be combined in uh, three in one combo, uh, combo which is uh, uh, str or single tablet regimen a smaller drug uh, without much of other life threatening side effects so under that situation there will be some adverse effect we need, which we need to uh, accept and till another option comes there is a good option which is raltegravir but it has to be taken twice cost of raltegravir is much more it is not combinable as a str uh, it is not available as a str combination so dolutegravir gets upper hand now i would like to touch upon two other issues number one uh, is tuberculosis tuberculosis is a very common infection in uh, developing countries including india uh, it is whether hiv there or not there so tuberculosis is anyway common but with hiv one of the most common comorbidity is tuberculosis and that can come when the immunity is poor or when the immunity is good or changing the immunity so sometime it can come as uh, as soon as you start art uh, you can get uh, 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 what do you call uh, 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 tuberculosis of lungs particularly a water filled region called tuberculosis uh, pleural effusion it can come gland tuberculosis and if there was already manifesting tuberculosis uh, in brain it can have a uh, what is life threatening issues and uh, this is uh, possible and tuberculosis also can come when there is a poor immunity but in that scenario gland tuberculosis and pleural effusion is less common miliary cox is more common extra pulmonary tuberculosis like abdominal cox is more common uh, florid bilateral tuberculosis is more common so we need to uh, guard with tuberculosis the problem with tuberculosis is that uh, even in india which is called a uh, pharma power of the world we have only four or five companies that are manufacturing anti tb drugs and they are coming under the nccp that is a national uh, price control order uh, npco uh, Na- national pharma price control order and under that the cost of medication for art uh, anti tb drug they are governed by government of india the costs are so low that by producing those drugs those pharma companies are loser not gainers so only two or three companies which have a commitment to control tuberculosis they are continuing and they are making losses in manufacturing anti tb drug so under this scenario there will be a severe shortage of anti tb drugs and you can imagine if there is a severe shortage of anti tb drugs in india then it will be shortage globally 
The second 90B drugs are also in short supply. And we need to safeguard the interest of both the industry as well as the patient. So governments will have to come to the rescue of this situation where tuberculosis drug, drug will vanish from market or pharma companies will no longer be interested in manufacturing tuberculosis, you know, anti-TB drugs. The third issue I'm tackling is basically hepatitis B or viral hepatitis. Uh, in viral hepatitis, there's hepatitis C and B. Hepatitis C is not vaccine preventable, but hepatitis B is 100% vaccine preventable. Government of India since 2011 incorporated hepatitis B vaccination as part of childhood immunization program which is along with polio, triple, measles, uh, rubella, even hepatitis B vaccine is given. It's a pentavalent vaccine in a five in one vaccine is given in injectable uh, form. So in that sense, any children or anybody who is born after 2011, they will be covered with hepatitis B vaccination. But there are several people who are vulnerable to hepatitis B. They are not uh, covered by hepatitis B vaccination and the vaccines are so cheap. I think if the bulk supply is there or bulk buying is there, in one US dollar, we can buy three doses of hepatitis B vaccine and three doses are required for lifetime. But what happens is all of us, uh, including um, HIV specialist, we have become tubular vision. When we talk about HIV, we do the test for uh, triple H, that means HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. These tests are done in all uh, integrated counseling and testing centers. The tests are done in all ART centers. The tests are done in all STD clinic or pregnancy clinic. They are called triple H. After doing triple H, if uh, other two H are found negative, like hepatitis B or hepatitis C, we are not advocating hepatitis B vaccine there, there and then. And we keep on doing triple H test at the time of surgery, at the time of blood transfusion, at the time of pregnancy. So triple H has become such a common thing that you go for even tooth extraction, triple H will be done. But at the same time, we are not advocating hepatitis B vaccine, even to those people which are hepatitis B negative. So much so that even people from medical community, surgeon, obstetrician, gynecologist, anesthesiologist, which are exposed day in and out, day out to hepatitis B, they are not vaccinated fully. So that kind of awareness about hepatitis B vaccination is not there. And I think we should do that. Uh, is better late than never. We should start vaccination of hepatitis B in mass. So we can prevent. Currently, if you see if HIV is controlled to some extent and hepatitis B is growing, it has outnumbered uh, HIV cases. And though the chances of hepatitis B positive person ending up with fulminant cirrhosis or dying of uh, liver cancer is rare. But in that percentage, if the number of uh, cases are very high, even that small percent will result in millions of deaths. So I think we should prevent those preventable deaths uh, due to hepatitis B and we should start uh, advocating hepatitis B vaccine to the entire community, to risk taking community as well as the, to the medical community. Uh, to give you just a brief uh, uh, comparison between HIV, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, if somebody is infected with all three viruses, the chance to pick up HIV is 0.3%, that is 3 in 1000 in one single sex which is unprotected with HIV positive person. It can go up to 1% in MSM uh, sexual activity. But if you talk about hepatitis C, it is 10 times more transmissible. So it becomes uh, from 0.3%, it becomes 3%. So hepatitis B, uh, C is 10 times more transmissible than HIV. If you talk about hepatitis B, it is 100 times more transmissible than HIV. So with a single sexual contact with a hepatitis B positive person, the person's chance to pick up hepatitis C is 30%, right? 0.3% HIV, 3% hepatitis C, and 30% hepatitis B, and similarly 30% uh, syphilis. So the syphilis and hepatitis B are highly transmissible uh, infections, virus or bacteria, and we should be able to control them, uh, particularly hepatitis B with hepatitis B vaccination. Thank you. Hello, Sabita. Hello, hi, Tita. Uh, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay, okay. Go ahead. okay, thank you. 
Dr. Iswa <coughs> Gilada. This is very important. Uh, so with the IRT therapy and the risk of NCD, uh, Dr. Gilada stressed the importance of integrated treatment and medication. And overweight and obesity during HIV treatment increase the risk of developing diabetes, uh, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. He also stressed the importance of integrating uh, approach to uh, HIV infected persons with hepatitis B and C. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we are uh, heading it into the presentation of Dr. Paula Fujiwara, Chair of Task Force of the Global Pen Plan to NTB 2023-2030. And Dr. Fujiwara is also Scientific Advisors of Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Health and Development Epicat. In this session, Dr. Fujiwara will outline the global plan to NTB 2023-2030. Over to you, Dr. Fujiwara. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Gilada really set the stage for me to talk about tuberculosis as an important opportunistic infection for HIV. So in this present, short presentation, I'm gonna tell you what the global plan is to NTB for 2023 to 2030, what's new in it, how much money we need to uh, actually implement it, and what the impact is going to be of this global plan and the priority actions that we're going to do over the next eight years, and then talk about the key and vulnerable populations of which HIV is one, and how do we use this plan to promote global and country level advocacy plans. So in terms of what it is, this is a costed advocacy plan for tuberculosis. So we know how much we need and actually to do the interventions. And this was something that was de uh, developed collaboratively. We had a 24 person task force, uh, NTP managers, the community, the private sector, uh, scientists. We had regional consultations, about seven of them. And also we had two surveys to see how the current plan is being used and how it could be improved. This is the sixth time we're doing this plan and it's required, uh, it, it was, it was uh, required for the HLM in 2023, and it was promised uh, it, at the 2018 HLM. Who's the audience for this? It basically, it's, it's, it has something for everyone. The NTP managers are obviously very important, but also the uh, national AIDS programs, donors, community, the private sector, activists, researchers. And this is a living document. We have to have this go for eight years, so it will change with time. So this is what's new in this plan and how are we going to use it for advocacy? This is a people-centered plan. It is not a patient-centered plan. It's not a person-centered plan. It is people-centered. So it means that everyone who's affected by tuberculosis, not only the person with tuberculosis, but their families, the community is also included. This time we're looking at something beyond just TB infection and TB actually active disease. It's that subclinical uh, progress from becoming infected to coming, to coming down with disease. Another new thing in this is One Health. And this is the inter interface between animals, humans, and the environment. And zoonotic tuberculosis, the transmiss transmissible tuberculosis from mostly cattle to humans is something that is covered. The other thing is that we see the similarities between COVID-19 and tuberculosis. And so we are postulating that tuberculosis should be the center for the next pandemic that's going to be, the next pandemics that will happen. We also talk about mental health for the first time in this plan, the post-TB life, because TB doesn't end just as long as, as you finish your medication, but people can have sequelae from that. And we have an increased emphasis now on airborne infection and control. Uh, this is something that we know about in tuberculosis, but this be really become much more prominent with COVID-19. And then the, for the first time in this plan, we're going to be actually talking about a TB vaccine. We'll end by I'll end by talking about the, what the return on investment is for investing in tuberculosis and what happens if we don't do anything. And finally, research, research, research. We need more research for new diagnostics, new medications, and 
obviously a vaccine. And this has to be a dialogue between the community and also the researchers so each one can assist each other. So what are, what are the needs for this plan over the next eight years? Uh, the the take home message is that TB gives value for money and it goes beyond the 2030 uh, deadline for this plan, it goes to 2050. So by 2050, if you invest $1 in tuberculosis, you get a $40, $40 return on investment. And if you look at low income countries and lower middle income countries, that return is even greater, $59 for every dollar that you invest in tuberculosis. How much money do we need to end tuberculosis in the next eight years? We need, it's estimated uh, through um, evaluations with our, with our colleagues on the economic side, about $250 billion. Most of this is going to be needed for the prevention and care, but the new thing, as I mentioned, is tuberculosis vaccination. But we also need to continue having research and development for those new tools that I mentioned. So if we break that down in the right-hand part of the slide, you can see that much of it goes for the medications and the diagnostics, but also the new vaccines. But we need to keep doing that research in order to get the new tools. This graph shows between 2023 and 2030, what are we going to use this money for? And you can see that in the bottom row is diagnosis. A lot of money is going to be have to be used for uh, de uh, developing, using the diagnostic tools and developing new tools. But treatment in orange and prevention in gray is a relatively small piece of that, of that need. What's important is the health systems in the lighter blue, the enablers in green and the program costs which could constitute a bulk of the resource needs until 2030. But you can see the yellow in yellow is the vaccination. This is new in this global plan. So by 2026, we, est we, would, we are hoping for a vaccine by 2025. So by 2026 and then 2027, when we ratchet up, that will be the big cost that's new. What about our impact of the global plan and the, what kind of actions can we do between 2023 and 2030? What are, we, what are we hoping to gain by doing this plan? We want to basically diagnose everyone that has tuberculosis and we want to look and screen the high risk and key and vulnerable populations of which HIV is one and screen them periodically because these are at high risk. We're gonna have 50 million people access treatment for tuberculosis, and that includes 3.7 million children and also a significant number of people with drug resistant tuberculosis. Again, HIV will figure prominently in the preventive therapy. 35 million people will be able to access preventive therapy for tuberculosis. And it's not just the, with the traditionally it's been isoniazid, but we now have shorter regimens. And we're going to have at least one TB vaccine for widespread use starting in 2026 and then ratcheting up full scale in 2027. And this is compared to the 2015 deadline which is when the uh, SDG started, we're gonna have an 80% decline in deaths and a night, excuse me, in, in the number of people with tuberculosis and a 90% decline in deaths. So how do we address key and vulnerable populations? The first thing is what are key and vulnerable populations for tuberculosis? There are three different categories. One is, do you have an increased exposure to tuberculosis because of where you live or where you work? And this includes people like prisoners, sex workers, healthcare workers, community health workers. The second group is you, have, you don't have access to good TB services. These include people who are moving around, migrant workers, women in settings with gender disparity, children who have to rely on their, on their parents, refugees, undocumented people, and LGBTQ uh, community. And the third group includes people that are an increased risk of tuberculosis because of their biologic factors or behavioral factors that com compromise their immune function. And this is again, people living with HIV, people with diabetes, as was mentioned by Dr. Gilada, silicosis, undernourished, people who smoke, people who use, uh, use uh, alcohol excessively or drugs. So those are the key and vulnerable populations that we think about when we talk about tuberculosis. So how do we prioritize? How do we get them involved? How do we reach the key and vulnerable populations? 
First of all, we have to have, make sure that we have good access to TB prevention and care because they are a high priority. And also this means using the primary care and integrated health services, giving the support the needs for nutrition because undernutrition is the highest risk factor for tuberculosis, giving support for people with TB and HIV, uh, for smokers uh, di and diabetics. We also have to understand what kind of barriers people, the people in the key and vulnerable populations face that may not be as evident to those who aren't in this population. So we have to understand the social barriers, the political barriers, the legal barriers, and the economic barriers. We also have to bring in people from the key and vulnerable populations to be stakeholders and also partners in the fight against tuberculosis. And this means really coordinating and collaborating with programs, ministries, focused on gender rights and development. So the global plan contains nine chapters and each chapter talks about a theme that's important to tuberculosis. And in each of these chapters, we have listed at the top of the page, key priority actions for each of the uh, interventions. And then what are the advocacy opportunities for those? It's, it's, uh, there's not enough time to go through all of them, but I focus, when you focus on the TB care, as I mentioned, it's a people-centered care. We wanna make sure that we're looking at people with subclinical disease that maybe they don't have the symptoms of tuberculosis, but they actually have it. And then TB prevention, this new emphasis on airborne infection prevention and control, and obviously having a vaccine as a preventive measure, a prevention from infection to disease, but even for treatment for tuberculosis. In terms of the stakeholders and the communities, we wanna have increased money for communities. We think that the community needs four times the amount of funding that they're getting right now. We wanna emphasize more on the community and the home-based models. Public-private mix is also very important. And we have to get the new partners because tuberculosis traditionally has, not, uh, has, has relied on the same groups over and over. And the other issues are universal health care is important, but TB at the center of the pandemic prepared response, because the next pandemic will also be respiratory. And this is going to be this is going to be very important that we use the skills that we know from tuberculosis at the center. Uh, making sure that we address the key and vulnerable populations. It has its own chapter, looking at human rights, looking at eliminating stigma and discrimination, being sure that responsive to gender, reducing, reducing the, and reaching all of the K, uh, KVPs. Uh, we're going to be needing much more research and development for the new tools, as I've already mentioned, and the cost for that. And then we're going to be needing resource, resources and what the return on investment. How do we promote the global and country TB advocacy plans? How do we make sure that this is going to be in, an important agenda item for the world? Countries will be needing support in how they think about tuberculosis because traditionally their TB programs are given a, a bunch of money and then they say, okay, how do we prioritize? No. We want TB programs to cost out. What do we need in order to end tuberculosis? And then as the budget comes in, then we can start prioritizing. But we, we need to have people look at the whole picture. The other thing is that there are many different audiences for this uh, plan. So we wanna make sure that we develop the advocacy materials and packages, which we're starting to do now to actually help with this resource uh, mobilization. Private sector may, may, may need something that a key and vulnerable population doesn't need, but how can we actually help that process? Remember that I said that there's going to be an HLM on tuberculosis, the second one. Uh, the first one was in 2018. This will happen next September, 2023 at the UN General Assembly. The G20 is a very important, this is the, for the G20 countries. And this year, the G20 is in Indonesia, the, in India will happen next year, and then 2024 will be Brazil. These are all high TB burden countries. So in a way, we are fortunate that we can put the spotlight on tuberculosis. The tuberculosis is part of SDG number three. It's actually specifically mentioned, but there are eight other non-TB uh, strategic development, uh, I mean, su sustainable development goals that are also related to tuberculosis, the gender one, climate, uh, the, the, there are other issues, children. So we need to incorporate 
these SDGs within the TB response. And then Global Fund is coming up with its round, an, a new funding round for 2023. And that's a place. And a place like just today, just speaking at this, at this meeting is a way to uh, actually promote so to end, the digital report is now published. It was published just exactly three weeks ago. And it is, it is an online living document. We are not making printed copies. You can, however, go online. The, the, the link is, is below. Go there. You can use your computer. You can use your iPad. You can use your phone. And it scales down to the, the um, instrument that you're using. And you can look at uh, the whole plan in a digital form. If you want to download a PDF, as you can. Currently, it's in English. We will be developing it in, in Spanish, French, and in Russian, and that will be coming in the next few months. So end there, and again, the fight against tuberculosis is also part of the fight against HIV. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Paola Fujiwara. We have a lot of questions because it's very interesting, it's very new about uh, your uh, global TB plan. And uh, I would like to read out uh, some question for you. This is very interesting from Warune Kuti Tamre. How one help approach help with TB? Is bacteria also in animal? Thanks. This is the first question, Dr. Pollack. Yes. So as I mentioned, uh, One Health is this interface between animals, humans, and the environment. And tuberculosis has a special group. It's, it's, uh, it's called, if there's an M. Macobacterium bovis, which is part of the same family of tuberculosis. It's mostly in cattle. It can be in wildlife. But this is the transmission. So people that work with cattle, for example, are at risk for developing this kind of tuberculosis. So that's the link between the animal and the human populations. Just as COVID, uh, it, came, you know, it came from an animal source, uh, many, and all of the, not all, but many of the other uh, zoonotic uh, tuberculosis, they start in the animal kingdom. So that's, that's where TB and, zoon and One Health is very much intimately related. Thank you, Dr. Pola. This is the other questions. Uh, we have question from Diana Wangamri. It is so eye-opening to read value of doing TB control. Is it easier to raise money with golf now with this evidence? Over to you, Dr. Pola. This is the hope. This plan is for, you know, we, we've developed it now. It's 2022 and we're ratcheting up for the what's coming up in 2023 to 2030. This is the hope that it is, it is a costed plan. It is very uh, carefully figured out. And as you probably know, if you work in the HIV world, the TB world is also often the very poor cousin or younger brother or sister and doesn't get enough attention. So we are hoping with the advocacy that we'll be doing over the next year in the lead up to the, to the HLM, we'll be able to use this and say, you know, this gives you value for money. As I said, $1, for, for every $1 you invest, you get $40 return on investment. Rita, did you want to say more? Because you're muted, if you are. <laughs> OK, sorry. Uh, this is uh, the third question from uh, Nahid. Is gender response part of global plan as gender inequalities make women more at risk of late diagnosis, infection, and late or no treatment and stigma, as well as discrimination? What is your thought? Absolutely. There's a whole chapter devoted to the whole issue of, uh, as I say, key and vulnerable populations, but also we're very, very sensitive to the issue of gender inequality, and we want to be receptive to, to all, you know, all people. So women in particular, as you have pointed out, uh, they often, uh, although tuberculosis is very common in men, the women are the ones that do not get the services necessarily very easily. So this is something, and then the stigma that happens with, uh, in particular with tuberculosis, but especially with women, is also something that this plan addresses. So it's a very prominent place in, place in this plan. It has its own chapter that I hope that you will read. 
Many thanks. Uh, the, we have four questions uh, from Brian in Kenya. Uh, it is important you point out uh, uh, mal malnutrition is the biggest risk factor, but food security programs are the working closely with TB programs in Kenya or other countries. Over to you. So the, que the question is, are, there, are they working together? And this is something that we have to highlight. I think that traditionally people have always thought uh, and it's important that HIV is, you know, is the biggest, the biggest risk factor, but it's actually this undernutrition and undernutrition because it affects so many more people. And part of this plan is to say, we need to collaborate. We cannot do this alone. So working with other programs uh, to, to actually to actually collaborate with the TB response is something that's very important. So food security programs is something that is going to be looked at. And this, this is in line with the uh, SDGs also. So it all uh, interfaces together. Many thanks. Uh, do we still have time, Bobby, Sabita? Because there are so, uh, some more questions for Dr. Paula. Yes, uh, yes, Rita, we can we still yeah. have about 11 okay. minutes. And okay, then the, uh, the Dr. Tara Singh Baum, Tara, yeah. Rita, so, uh, I'll just read out Dr. Tara Singh Baum's message. Okay. As he was uh, one of the panelists, uh, he has sent his message. It is on the chat. But those of you who are not able to read the chat and <coughs> watching it on the screen, uh, okay. for them, Dr. Tara Singh Baum, the Asia Pacific Director of International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, um, has, uh, has sent in his message. And uh, I will quote him In global yeah. public health for any issue, there is science, there is technical capacity, there is plan, there is financial commitment, there is talk and so on. But what is not there sufficiently is local actions. Local actions are needed through local governance. Local governance for HIV prevention is needed through local legislation at city or state level. It builds accountability of mayor, governor, and local leaders. Mayors are in best position to identify local action solutions to address local problems. Local leadership is essential to make effective analysis of local problem, use of local resources, community participation, and public engagement. Uh, thus, we need to work together to bring solutions that are relevant in local context under the leadership of mayor to make uh, mayor accountable and ensure sustainability of the program. So this was Dr. Tara Singh Baum's message. Uh, the text of this message, the recording of this session, uh, the presentation of Dr. Paula Fujiwara will be under the media tab of ACE 2022 interactive platform. So all of you can go and watch it or refer to it after the session as well. Over to you, uh, Rita. We still have about eight or nine minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Tara. This is uh, another question for Dr. Paola from Warune. How can we do more in TB prevention? We did not do much before 2018 HLM on TB. Is global plan going to have accelerate TB prevention? Over to you, Dr. Paola. Yes, TB prevention, again, has its own chapter within the plan, and you are absolutely right. Uh, for some, for various reasons, uh, people talk about the pe person with disease, but they don't talk as much about preventing tuberculosis. But I think that we have a new tool in our tool, well, we'll have a new tool in the uh, toolbox of prevention. There, there are a couple things. One is the, the, uh, the treatment for TB prevention is getting shorter. And that's, that's gonna help because no one wants to take medications for, you know, traditionally it's been six months. The other thing is that we are postulating that, that the vaccine will be used as a preventive tool because you can give back, there are three different types of vaccines. You can give it to prevent the person from actually becoming infected with the disease. You can, once you're infected, you can prevent, you can have a vaccine to prevent them from going on to active disease. And then if you have the active disease, you can get, take a vaccine in order to prevent, prevent the um, continuation of the disease. So right now the focus has been, you know, BCG is, as we know, is traditionally been given at birth and it's to prevent you from becoming infected. It's not always as it, effective, but the vaccines that are currently being concentrated on are really the ones that once you're infected, what do you do to prevent yourself from going on to active disease? So that's going to be, prevention is a very key element and it is a part, uh, it is part of, this, of this plan. Uh, many thanks. Dr. Borasel, uh, may I uh, ask you some questions? Uh, you, you, you told us that uh, the, res the resource needed to 
and TB by 2030 is US 250 billion. Uh, you know, how could the world gain so much funding while we are in the middle of pandemic, global, political, and financial uncertainty in this time of a I <laughs> because think TB you... is under as investment, right? It's always Absolutely. under investment. I think you've answered, Rita, I think you've answered your own question. We had this pandemic and we saw this outpouring of money for COVID. So it means that when there is political will, it can be done. So what has to happen is that TB as a disease has to have that same political will. Now the issue is, is that there are very there are many similarities between COVID and and, and um, TB. And but but what what was unfortunate is that the the COVID community used the resources of tuberculosis, the infrastructure of tuberculosis. And they, they didn't add on, they took it away. So the thing is, is that we need to really advocate for the, the importance of tuberculosis. And if you have that will, as we had with COVID, it can be done. So no one can tell me that it cannot be done. It can. Okay, the wrap up questions. What, what are the most challenging uh, you think uh, the, the task force team are facing to accomplish this goal? the most challenging things ahead? Well, there, I think there are a couple. One is money. Obviously we need the money to do this work. We need to involve every, it has to be in all, all, you know, we always like to talk about all of government effort and, but it's an all of world effort. And that means that even if you are personally not affected, you have to think about your fellow human and, and think about the, the it, think about that, person who maybe not be who is also being infected so that's that's very important the other issue that i think is is we really need a vaccine we saw again with covid like in in one year we had you know several several vaccines and in tb is, there's nothing years. it's 100 <laughs> years and there's only one vaccine so so the, the thing is vaccine is really going to be key and we are we are really advocating for that pushing for that in, in the coming two years. So by 2026, we can start. And by 2027, we can be at full speed. Many thanks. I think the time is over. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Paula Fujiwara for staying awake in San Francisco. <laughs> and I hope all the answer that Dr. Paula Fujiwara uh, gave to you uh, uh, could satisfy your, 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 your question. So uh, if you need more uh, question, you can send it to Bobby and Sabita. Again, thank you, Dr. Paula. Thank you uh, for your insight and uh, your optimistic <laughs> uh, vision. <laughs> so we are, it's contagious. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, I will uh, invite uh, my uh, dear colleague, Nurul Islam, uh, my senior editors of Bangladesh Post and founding member of Epicat Media to uh, send our, our thankfulness, our gratitude to all the panelists and uh, participants of this uh, important webinar today. Uh, over to you, Nuru. Uh, thanks, Rita. After this uh, excellent presentation and your excellent moderation, I think I have uh, no job uh, left for me. Uh, but thanks, uh, Bobby, CNS, and uh, again, the EPICAT for uh, jointly hosting this event. This is very important at, uh, because uh, what we are seeing that, you know, the people with uh, HIV, uh, HIV, still they are having the treatment. They are facing other problems. So it needs and, uh, a different kind of approach that uh, Dr. Uh, Ishar uh, Gilada rightly pointed out and uh, uh, Dr. Paula. Paula is a very uh, popular face in scientific arena in the world. And Dr. Tara Singbam, you know, despite he could not uh, join the session, he sent a very, uh, I mean, specific and very right message to us that uh, local level action is uh, strongly needed. So uh, if I take a few things from the things, for example, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ishwar Gilada said that uh, particularly the shortage of TB drugs in India, he, he flagged the issue. So if it is so, then it will be a, 
global crisis. And again, the TB is an infectious uh, disease, and so we know the, what the infectious disease can do. So with all of this, I can, I can say that we need uh, strong global cooperation and solidarity to fight any, any disease. And the latest example is monkeypox. You know, the monkeypox uh, was there in Africa for long, but it somehow neglect, it was neglected and the world ignored it. And finally, now it's uh, turned up as a, as a I mean, global public health emergency. So this is the thing I think uh, for any disease we need to uh, take. Uh, so uh, we need to take it seriously and uh, we need to uh, take uh, global uh, cooperation and solidarity. I mean, the action, this is very important. And uh, also Paula mentioned the One Health uh, approach because uh, diseases are coming from the animals. So it's, uh, it needs, I mean, uh, uh, joint effort from the I mean, agriculture department, animal health, and uh, I mean, human health department, all health uh, need to come together to fight any disease. I think uh, there is nothing more from my side. I again uh, thank, you, uh, thank you. I mean, thanks everyone, the <coughs> panelists, the participants, and CNS, Bobby, and his team, and uh, of course, the APCAP that brings us, uh, the journalists, particularly Rita, me, all together under one platform. Thank you. Over to you, Bobby. Thank you, Nuru, for a closing. Excellent closing. Thank you. Hello, Bobby. Again, thank you very much for attending this webinar. I think uh, I would like to again thank you, everyone. Thank you, all distinguished panelists and participants, Epicat Media, CNS. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.